So from the time I could crawl, my dad would put pillows in front of me and put my toys on the other side of them to, to teach me how to overcome obstacles. And to this day, I'm unstoppable. Now, I won't cheat somebody or step on them or, or do anything underhanded, but if you tell me I can't do something, you know, you better get out of the way as I blow by you doing it. <laughs> All right. So, so that was always a, a function of a, a, a guy that came with nothing and, uh, you know, bootstrapped himself up to become an entrepreneur, made me an entrepreneur and made me tough as nails. So with only a second grade education. That is Tom Antion this week on the Do It For Yourself podcast. How's it going? Welcome or welcome back to the Do It For Yourself podcast. My name is Ian and I am the host of this podcast. And before we get into today's guest, I need to ask you for a favor. Somebody brought this to my attention the other day and they were 100% correct. I have a ton of episodes out there. I have a pretty good amount of downloads on said episodes, but my reviews on Apple podcast are really lacking. So if you could right now, while you're doing your cardio, you're walking around the house, doing some chores, maybe cutting the lawn, whatever the case may be. If you could take two minutes and please leave a review on iTunes, I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. It's super simple. Only takes two minutes. And it's going to help me out a ton. So on to today's guest. My guest this week on the podcast is Tom Antion. And Tom has been doing it for himself since he was a kid. Tom never actually had a job. He has always owned his own business. Um, and he's been an entrepreneur for about 44 ish years now. And this is a very, very fun story. We get into all kinds of different stuff that, uh, that Tom has been into some very, very interesting situations, um, from owning nightclubs in the state of West Virginia to owning hotels and apartment buildings, um, all the way up through some of the things that he's done kind of later on, um, after his, I guess you could say, crazy days. So this is a very, very wide-ranging conversation, um, but it's a very fun conversation, and I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Tom. Just want to say, uh, Tom, thank you so much for joining me here on this this afternoon edition of the Do It For Yourself podcast. Um, I am really, really looking forward to diving into your story and some of the many different uh, avenues it has taken because you have been doing it for yourself literally for the past 44 years and you've been doing it for yourself in such a way that you have never technically let's say had a boss. You've been an entrepreneur since you were a little kid. Um, so I'm really looking forward to to getting into this. And and as I said, you know, you haven't technically had a boss because as a lot of entrepreneurs will say, depending on what industry you're working in, um, if you are working in an industry where you have clients, then yes, you don't have a boss, but your clients are your boss <laughs> from what right, I have right. heard. So um, again, thank you for joining me. And uh, I look forward to to getting into your story. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And yeah, it's uh, really kind of 54 years now. Uh, since I was about 10 years old, I've been just doing my own thing. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, they say uh, an entrepreneur will work 18 hours a day to get out of working eight hours a day for somebody else. You know? <laughs> so, so that's been kind of my story. And, and yeah, I mean, uh, 
all my clients are my bosses technically. So I've had, you know, probably 50,000 bosses when you look at it all up. But uh, you know what? Boss spells backwards, right? No. Double S O double S O B. Yes. Yeah. So, so I try to be a good boss to the people that I work with, but uh, I'm not one that uh, takes orders very well if, if they're, uh, you know, just ridiculous. You know, a lot of people that are above you is sometimes because of nepotism and uh, just telling you stuff to justify their existence. And I don't really work that well in that kind of environment. Well, and that's very common for a lot of entrepreneurs. And it's one of my favorite questions to ask because I usually like to get a glimpse into if the entrepreneurs that I've had on the podcast. I love to get a glimpse into what they were like when they were in elementary school, middle school age, you know, and how resistant they were to someone telling them what to do. <laughs> and then what it was like for them while they had their first jobs and they had a boss. So. You did not have a first job, but you kind well, of. Well, I actually uh, had a little bit of job on a golf course uh, when I was in high school, and then I uh, <laughs> the job uh, the one job that I had in college. You won't believe what I was. I was a hooker. <laughs> <laughs> That's the absolute truth. I worked at the Homestead Steelworks for one summer in Pittsburgh, where they had these overhead cranes that had chains on them and one guy on one end of an I-beam and one on the other. And we would hook the crane on and lift uh, the I-beam and lift it and put it on a train. So I tell people I started out as a hooker in Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> and that was probably back where the time where that, that whole industry was really booming in Pittsburgh. Oh yeah. The, well, steel town, that's, that's mm -hmm. what it's called. If uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the movie flash dance, but one of the songs was maniac and it was a steel town girl on a Saturday night. You know, so that was Pittsburgh. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was all steel and, and all that stuff. But the, even before that, Ian, my dad came from Syria on a cattle boat when he was uh, maybe three years old and came into Ellis Island. And uh, and my name is kind of a mistake. See, back in those days, this was the early 1900s, like 1907, something like that. They named you from where you were born, what village you were born in. So he his name was Simon from Antioch, Antioch, Syria. And so when he got to Ellis Island, they're looking, trying to read it, and they're saying, okay, you're Sam Antion. So that's how I got my, my name. But uh, did you ever hear of uh, Johnny Cash? Absolutely. Okay, well, Johnny Cash wrote a song called A Boy Named Sue. I Oh, I love that song. You love that <laughs> yes, song? Well, yes, yes. <laughs> let me tell you about that song. So, the, and let me tell the listeners about it. They may not know the song, but the idea was as an old drunk cowboy was growing up and figured he wouldn't be around to raise his boy. So he named them Sue. So the kid would have to scrap and crawl and get teased and fight it up to get, make him tough. That was the general uh, idea of the song. So my dad, you know, comes with a second grade education He's in his 50s when he has me, the uh, baby of six boys, and he figured he wasn't going to be around to help me grow up. So from the time I could crawl, my dad would put pillows in front of me and put my toys on the other side of them to, to teach me how to overcome obstacles. And to this day, I'm unstoppable. Now, I won't cheat somebody or step on them or, or do anything underhanded, but if you tell me I can't do something, you know, you better get out of the way as I blow by you doing it. <laughs> all right. So, so that was always a, a function of a, a, a guy that came with nothing and, uh, you know, bootstrapped himself up to become an entrepreneur, made me an entrepreneur and made me tough as nails. So with only a second grade education. Now, was that your first, um, exposure to entrepreneurship? Was your dad? Yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, he moved from Pittsburgh, the filthy air and the time at Pittsburgh back in the uh, 40s. And he didn't want his kids growing up in that, you know, it was a tough town. And besides the steel and the dirty air and everything. So he took er risk everything. This is one of the quotes I have about him. He risked everything, took uh, $10,000, moved 50, 60 miles out, bought a farm and a bulldozer and enough diesel to run it and knocked off the top of a mountain and then build a truck stop on National Route 40 going through western Pennsylvania there. And so uh, before I was even 
born, that was happening. So when I was born, I grew up in that environment that, you know, he ran a gas station, truck stop, cottages, motel. And uh, so, yeah, that's all I saw from the time I, uh, I could speak. And those first two, two jobs that you had, how long did those last before you realized, nope, this is a no-go, this is not for me? Well, they were both summer jobs. And uh, the thing was, though, uh, Ian, is that I didn't look at it like that because my dad instilled such a killer work ethic in me that it didn't matter at the time that I was working for somebody else. What mattered was is that I was excellent and without supervision did a great job. That's all that mattered. In fact, I almost got killed on the Homestead Works job because the quotas were so low. Uh, we would be done in two hours and then everybody be sitting around sleeping for the six hour shift. And I, I'm like trying to do stuff on the side. And these guys are telling me, stop it, cut it out. You're going to, they're going to raise our quota. And we'll have to work harder. And I, it just didn't make sense to, I just could not understand that mentality. And so there was times when they tried to knock the beams into me to hurt me really bad, you know, because of that. So, so it's not, uh, in many places, it's, it's not appreciated that you're a hard worker, mm -hmm. but my dad had instilled it in me. And so that kind of was the way that molded that I don't really belong around these people because I don't think like them. I, I do quality work, whether somebody's watching or not, or whether I'm getting free or $2 an hour at the, at the time it was five bucks an hour to work in a major steel mill. And, uh, it didn't matter because my dad's work ethic. So I, when I started being exposed to those type of people was probably when I thought, you know, this is never going <laughs> to, I'm never going to fly in it. Either I'll, they'll kill me or, <laughs> or I'll quit or whatever. But, uh, uh, so I, it did have an impact on me, but the, the summer job at the golf course didn't though, because I was out cutting grass by myself all the time anyway. But those were, uh, enough to, uh, to uh, get a little taste of what other, other people have to put up with. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't for me. And so you made your, you made a transition and while you were in college and before you had graduated, you had owned five apartment buildings and a hotel. This was all prior to graduating from college. Correct. Correct. So talk to me about that a little bit. H how did you get into that industry? Where did you where did you get the funding to purchase those buildings? I'm assuming you didn't purchase all five apartment buildings at the same time. And no, these, not these all were at once. acquired over time. So yep. um, can you talk to me a little bit about that? Sure. Sure. Well, I was uh, s sitting there. First of all, I went to college on a football scholarship. I was all state football in the, in Western Pennsylvania. And, uh, so, uh, so besides the workout time and besides going to class, which I actually did as a jock, you know, <laughs> most of them don't, uh, all this college athlete stuff is all BS. I mean, most of it's just a big business is what it is. But anyway, so I, I was reading a book long before this no money down stuff was became in vogue for real estate. And it was how I turned a thousand dollars into a, a million dollars in real estate by William Nickerson. I'm reading this book. I'm sitting, I remember sitting in Sunnyside on the sidewalk, <laughs> reading this book in between classes. And I thought I could do that. So I went looking and I, and I found an old attorney who was wanting to retire and he owned the building free and clear, three unit apartment building. And so uh, I made a proposal to him and he said, okay. So he held the financing. I didn't have to go to a bank. I just paid him off every month. And then I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you know, if I could put another bedroom, they rented by the person in those days because it was a college town. So I said, if I could put another bedroom on this place, I could get the rent up another $125 a month. That's what the rent was per kid. Like. True entrepreneur, right? Just yeah. bam, right there. How can I make so, more money doing this? Exactly. So how do I, how am I going to do it? You know, cause, uh, um, and my dad had always been in construction and taught me a lot of stuff. So at the time, uh, Mountaineer field, old Mountaineer field in downtown Morgantown, West Virginia was taking out all the wooden seats and throwing them away and replacing them with plastic seats, bleachers. So I took my, I, I had a pickup truck. I took and grabbed all the stuff they were throwing away. I bought a $10 circular saw at Kmart and I ripped, ripped means instead of cutting across the boards, you 
cut them lengthwise. And I, and I ripped and made two by fours out of them. And I went up into the attic and I remodeled uh, and I built another bedroom and got the income up $125 a month. There was no extra plumbing I had to put in. I just had to, to frame out another bedroom. <laughs> and so, so I got the income up 125 a month. And then I went, found another lawyer that was retiring, did a four unit apartment building, did the same thing. And I just parlayed that. But the, the big thing that I want to impart to your, to your folks is uh, called the concept of excellence. And my dad taught me this always to be excellent at what you do. And people will notice. And the other big concept, Ian, is give before you get. So here's what happened. So I was renting to all these students and I was charging more true entrepreneur than I was paying myself <laughs> to rent. <laughs> all right. So, so, uh, but every time the landlord would come over, I'd say, Hey Frank, you know, I'll help you to put those gutters on, but you teach me what you're doing. Right. He said, okay. So, you know, do all that through the whole year. And at the end of the year, he comes to me and says, Hey Tom, I want to talk to you. And I'm thinking, oh, what'd we do? You know, I'm thinking like, oh, what's, what's, is he mad at us? What? He said, in the 25 years that I have been renting apartments in Morgantown, West Virginia to students, not once ever has anybody offered to help me, let alone try to learn something about the construction and the real estate business. He said, I want to retire and move to Florida and I have a hotel about 20 minutes away in Fairmont, West Virginia, and I want you to take it over. <laughs> and I'm like, what? You know, so, so he said, here's the deal. You come up with the first mortgage. I will hold back the second mortgage, which was very similar to what those other guys had done. You know, instead of taking all the money at once, they would let me pay off. Uh, so I didn't have to come up with a down payment. It was the true no money down. And so I went to, uh, so another concept is persistence. I went to 50 different lending institutions that all pooed, sh uh, shooed me away. Like I'm, yeah, you got a couple little apartments, but this is a hotel, you know, just shoo away your little, little kid. Mm -hmm. Well, which infuriated me. And I'm thinking to my dad, putting those pillows in front of me and to overcome obstacles. So I just kept going, got going. Finally, somebody bid on the first mortgage. He took back the second mortgage. I went down once a week for six years made about $65,000 a year while I'm still in college on the property and sold it to the city for a couple hundred thousand. <laughs> so this is in the seventies, early seventies, but the whole thing boiled down to Ian, give before you get and, and be excellent in what you do and, uh, learn something from people. And, the, and you'll stand out like a sore thumb because a lot of people just, you know, you know, just glide through life and do nothing. And the people with the money, like that guy, give you a break if you show that you uh, have earned it. And so as you're going through college, you know, you're, you're going through college, first of all, mm -hmm. which is no yep. small feat, right? You are renting and owning and maintaining these properties on right. the side. Yep. And let us not forget that you're in school because you're there for football. So you're also playing football. I'm playing which, football, but I'm that, also getting good grades, you know? So, so, uh, it was, yeah, it was, but the thing was, it was nothing to me because of the great upbringing I had with my dad. And I realized people didn't have that, you know, some people didn't have that. So it's, it's a time in your life when you have to decide, well, I didn't have that good upbringing. What am I going to do about it? Am I going to cry about it the rest of my life or am I going to make changes? So it's all doable nowadays that you can change your life. And did you ever consider football going anywhere after you were done school? Well, we all had starry eyes to make pros, but only 5% uh, of high school uh, students make it in college football, and only 5% of them make it in the pros. And it became evident, but, you know, I was first team starting guard at a top 20 school. Pretty, pretty good accomplishment. Mm -hmm. But I could see the writing on the wall. I was not you know, uh, pro material, I wasn't good enough. You know, it's just, you know, it's a very, very high level there. And you know, I wasn't big enough, fast enough or strong enough. So, so, uh, but luckily I had a brain you know, and which many of them didn't, you know, there was 31 people in our freshman picture, only six of us graduated. 
The rest wow. of it got thrown in jail, flunked out, kicked out, on drugs, you know, arrested, you know, all this stuff. So uh, dead, some of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so I was fortunate that I, uh, I kept my grades up. And But it was like semi-pro, and this kind of leads into the weight loss thing is, you know, it was eight hours a day uh, just on the football stuff. Two-a-day workouts and yep. nine, 90 degrees, full pads, and anybody at that level can kill you, so you're really on your guard every second. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, a tough, tough uh, time. But, again, you know, with my upbringing, it was like that's just normal. That's the way it, way it goes. So you, you kind of saw the writing on the wall as far as, you know, going into the pros with football. And at the time of graduation and leading up to graduation, you know, a lot of people are focused on internships and finding an internship and doing this. And you already had enough going on <laughs> on the side. Because, <laughs> I'm laughing because that's so foreign to what I was thinking at the time. So what were you, well, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. You know, what were you thinking about? You, you obviously had a, a quite a bit going on on the side. And what was your um, degree that you graduated with? I was in uh, uh, psychology, uh, but I had took heavy, heavy business courses. So I had lots of business administration courses. So at the time, uh, my whole life was uh, going to the post office, picking up the rent checks, depositing them in the bank. And every Friday going down to the hotel just to pick up the deposits and make any little tiny repairs. And so that was my whole life. <laughs> so, so, but my mind will never stop. So I always wanted to, uh, uh, to fly. Uh, so I went and hung out at the airport. This was another example of giving before you get, and I got my private pilot's license. But if you want to fly the bigger planes, they're expensive. I mean, at the time, some of them were five, six, seven hundred dollars an hour. Wow. You can't, it couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't even spend that kind of money. So what I did is I hung out at the airport and I took every crappy flight they had just to ferry an aircraft or go to Wichita. This was kind of crazy. I would pick up new airplanes in Wichita where the Cessna and the Lear plant is. I, I couldn't fly Lear's, but I could pick up Cessna's, but they didn't have any navigation radios. You brought them back to your home base near Pittsburgh and then they put the navigation in. So I'd be flying down the route 70, reading the road signs, how to get back to Pittsburgh (laughs) (laughs) from that. But but anyway, so I built up my hours. And so then I got my commercial multi-engine instrument rating all for free from just, you know, hanging out and taking every crap job that they had that none of the big pilots wanted. And I'd fly across the country back and forth and do all this stuff. And uh, then they hired me. At the time, it was 30 bucks an hour. I was a part 135, which is a pretty high-level charter pilot for twin-engine, you know, six, seven-seat kind of planes. You know, it wasn't jets or anything. And uh, so it was another give before you get. So I got all these advanced ratings for free, uh, just, you know, sweat labor and all this experience. And I got uh, several years of freelance charter pilot. It wasn't, again, it wasn't a job. It was freelance kind of thing. So, so. Uh, yeah, so it was another example of give before you get. And you did that coming right out of, out of college? Yeah, because I was bored. I had nothing, you know, I had this money coming in, and uh, that was my whole day was stopping at the post office right. and then stopping at the bank. And then I'd play tennis, I'd watch movies, I, you know, there was no internet in those days. Uh, and just, you know, I was bored to death. So, so that's when I went and did all the flying stuff for a couple of years. Which is also something that is very common with entrepreneurs is that, you know, a a lot of people who are not entrepreneurs and look at it from the outside, they think, man, that must be great. You know, you set up this business, it starts to make money for you. And then you can just kick back and go to the beach or do this. You know, you could sit on an island somewhere. Uh, But what most people don't understand is that entrepreneurs don't have that ability. And, and it's not. Yeah, they don't think of just sitting around right. doing nothing. Right. They can't sit around and do right. nothing. It drives them absolutely insane. Right. And so that's exactly what you were experiencing. Mm-hmm. You go, you know, you're a pilot for two years. And then where does the nightclub come in? You owned and operated one of the yes. largest nightclubs in the state of West Virginia. Yeah. Uh, just- got you into some very, very <laughs> sketchy situations. Um, so where does that one come into play? 
Well, this is a, a good example of uh, youthful enthusiasm going a, little, a bit too far. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I was starting to get bored flying because I was basically a high-class chauffeur. I mean, there'd be times I'd fly these uh, executives from the steel mills down to Southern Virginia, and I'd be sleeping on the floor of the plane, and there's like a, a candy machine there, and I'm gaining weight. And, and so I'm bored with this. I said, I got to do something else. So my mother at the time up near Pittsburgh, there was a thing called Froggies, I think it was called. And um, it was like a sing-along place. And they threw peanut shells on the floor. And it was kind of a really character place. And so she kept bugging me, hey, why don't you start one of those? <laughs> so, so I said, okay. So I went and found a, a <laughs> this is where the stupid part comes in. <laughs> I found a biker bar that I didn't really know was a biker bar, and and I bought it. And I thought, I'm going to clean this place up, put us this sing-along restaurant, and build it. And I'm going to go ahead and build a big nightclub on the side. Well, I don't know. Call me crazy. The bikers didn't seem to like that idea. <laughs> so so uh, I was in two gunfights, knife fights, over 100 violent confrontations. Uh, they blew up my car, uh, set my signs on fire. You know, so these so, are like real. This these is are real, real bikers. Dealer. There was yeah. a there was a drug route between Uniontown, Pennsylvania, and um, Fairmont, West Virginia, which went right by my nightclub, which okay. was a stopping place for those guys. And then uh, there was another biker bar right up the street that stayed a biker bar. So they would like go up there and make plans to come and do me in. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I lived through that. I carried a gun all the time. And there was one state police and one sheriff. For 300 square miles. So it was truly the wild west, West Virginia. And, and here's the thing. Here's, I mean, when you look back, things are comical at the time it wasn't, but the day after the first shooting, <laughs> the, the, the sheriff came out the next day. Okay. And he says, uh, Hey Tom, I heard you had some excitement out here. I said, yeah, a little bit. He said, Did anybody get hurt? I said, well, you know, they didn't hit me, but I kind of, I know I hit their truck, but I haven't seen them <laughs> since. And he says, uh, here's, here was the investigation. Okay. Be careful. See you later. <laughs> and that was it. That was the whole thing. Oh, no paperwork, man. no nothing. Uh -huh. you know, so, so it was wild west there, but, uh, uh, and then, uh, the, it, it turned out, I mean, this was, uh, seven days a week for six years. I got four days off a year and one didn't count. Like, New Year's Day didn't count because you were so shot from New Year's Eve parties. Right. So uh, then uh, the the devastation came, which may have been done me a favor. I don't know how long I'd have lasted without getting killed, but but um, the drinking age went from 18 to 21. College town wiped me out. I lost four hundred thousand dollars. I was on my way to being a millionaire mm -hmm. by the time I was 30. Wiped me out totally, uh, and uh, it was just no way. But here's the thing. I refused to go bankrupt. I went to every creditor immediately and said, look, you guys know me. I will not screw you out of what I owe you. You just got to give me some time. And they said, oh, man, Tommy, we saw what happened to you. You know, OK, no problem. So every one of them said yes. And I paid them all off over time. You know, and that was one of the shining parts of my life is that my dad taught me, you know, people take believe in you, you don't screw them over. And, and yeah, bankruptcy has its place and it's important in life, but I didn't need, need it. I could climb up out of that hole and, and feel great for the rest of my life rather than screw all those people over that trusted me. So, so, uh, so anyway, got out of that, uh, that business alive and, uh, and then went from there. So in ultimately when, when the drinking age went from 18 to 21, you lost $400,000. Um, did did you sell the nightclub right then and there, and then that's when you had to pay off the creditors? No, or the, did you uh, the hold nightclub, on to it? No, the nightclub was a special use building with a commercial kitchen and and a big nightclub, and so it, ba it basically went back to the bank. And I went to the bank also, and I winterized the place, and I went and took the keys back and shook hands with the guy who everybody knew me. All right, so it wasn't a big surprise. And I, I said, look, I winterized the place. I did the best I could. And they said, Tom, we couldn't believe you lasted this long. And, you know, it's a shame what happened to you. Because they all knew that I worked there seven days a week. And I made a nice place for the fam families to come during the week for the restaurant. They, they all knew me, you know. 
So it was, they knew this, it was not me that did this. It was a strike of the legislative pen. But I could have run and hid, but I didn't. I walked and looked them right in the eye and said, here's the deal. So they took the, the, uh, the building back, but uh, all the other, you know, the beer distributors and the paper, pe- all those people I owed money to. So mm-hmm. those are all the ones I paid off. And you mentioned it when you were a pilot, but I'm sure working these crazy long hours while owning this nightclub um, also didn't help with this situation, but you had put on some weight as a pilot, and I'm assuming that you also put on some weight while you were running this nightclub business because you were essentially just running yourself into the ground, and you were not working out the same way that you were working out while you were playing football. You you had eight-hour days, two-a-day practices, you know, full pads, in the weight room probably a couple days right. a week, doing conditioning, all kinds of stuff. So you went from what would be a very active, high-level athlete to then someone who was almost sedentary because you were a pilot, and then you went, although you probably weren't sedentary as the owner of the nightclub, constantly in and out, constantly on your feet, you weren't doing the training that you used to be doing. So how much weight had you put on over this yeah, and, yeah, and you know the, uh, the the way it got started was enormous caloric intake mm-hmm. during the fifteen straight years that I was immersed in. Uh, you know, it was all state wrestling, fourth in the state of Pennsylvania, and uh, you know, a high level college athlete. And then you know, it's like the the minute you're done, you're like, I don't want to see a weight room forever. Yeah. Uh, and and but the caloric intake is still big. So I went from uh, playing at 255 pounds to I was about 360 pounds and doing nothing. And and even like at the nightclub, you say, you know, oh, yeah, you're walking around and doing tables and tending bar. But you can't do enough to make up for eating two pizza, two 18 inch pizzas. Right, you know, for right, dinner. right. You know, so so it was uh, six straight years of high stress, you know, being, you know, luckily I had had martial arts my whole life. And. I had been uh, kept up with that, but still, it wasn't in very good shape. But I was skilled in the, in the, so it was easy to to dispatch a lot of these people. But but still, my weight was uh, bad and, and 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 really bad. So uh, so that was uh, that's been a yo yo ever since until uh, recently when I ran across the ketogenic lifestyle, which is a low uh, carb moderate protein, high fat diet, a little bit controversial, but it's the only thing that ever worked for me. And, and, uh, and you go, you got to do it yourself. Like, you know, your, your podcast, Mm -hmm. you have to find what works for you. And, and people say, well, you know, that could be bad for your cholesterol and stuff. And I'm thinking, which is going to kill me first being morbidly obese, 150 (laughs) pounds overweight (laughs) or a little extra cholesterol, you know? Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. so, uh, but anyway, it was two days, and the, my, all my cravings that I had my whole life were gone. Two days of doing this, so so I'm really a big proponent of it, and it's uh, it's got a lot of backers. But uh, you know, every there's a million different diet plans, but but this one uh, worked for me. Yeah, I mean, there's people who come on, like there, there's you know the Atkins diet. You know, you can eat paleo. You could do this. There, there's uh, there's so many different things out there. Like you said, you got to find what works for you, and I think even and an adapted ketogenic diet um, is actually something that I prefer for myself. And that is, I prefer a little bit higher protein, not as high of a fat content as the the very, very traditional uh, keto diet. And, you know, I'm pretty selective about uh, when and where I have my carbohydrates. And when they talk about carbohydrates, at at least from my experience, they're talking about... um, like the starchy carbohydrates, potatoes, rice, you know, things of that Bread nature. And stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, vegetables, and I believe from what I've heard, uh, some fruits are actually okay as well for the ketogenic diet. Well, for me, uh, you know, I had to be super strict. Being that much uh, or morbidly obese, mm-hmm. I had to be super strict. So I kept my uh, carbs below 20 grams a day, which is extremely strict. But I, know, I found out that if I slipped, it was three days before I could get back into ketosis and get a good thing going again. So wow. I got to the point where, but I, I got to tell you the first 40 pounds, I was still eating a McDonald's, 
But I finally learned that, hey, you can throw the bun away and the world is not going to come to an end. Right. 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 You know, those starving children in Ethiopia are not going to come and uprise against me because I did it. Yeah. So, uh, so, um, uh, but it's, uh, it's the only thing that's been successful for me, uh, you know, and, and fairly easy to keep up with, you know, so, so, uh, uh it's much, uh, much better to be a hundred pounds down than <laughs> I don't know where I was for sure. That's the key too. The key is that it's the thing that works for you and you can keep up with it. You've kept up with it ultimately to lose a hundred pounds. And so that has worked for you. And that's the biggest thing. The biggest thing is you can sustain it. And I, I try and convey that message to people all the time. Oh, well, I'm going to try such and such, or I'm going to do this. And my favorite line is, oh, I'm going to go back to low carb because that's the only thing that's worked for me. Well, I hate to put it to you this way, but if it's the only thing that worked, why do you have to go back to it? That means that at one point in time, you stopped it. Why did you stop? If it's something okay. that works well, for you. Well, I do you, have you know? a legitimate <laughs> answer right there for you. I do have one legitimate answer for you. That it wasn't uh, my, under my control or, or it wasn't uh, something that I advocated. Uh -huh. But in January of 2018, I was in a hunting accident. And it would be such a great story, Ian, had I gotten shot. But I didn't. I fell on a log and perforated my intestines. They they got me to a trauma center in Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, operated. You know, I was in intensive care for a week. And then six to eight months of uh, couldn't lift anything. You know, it was a pretty nasty right. uh, thing. And they, they, they told me that we need you to have maximum nutrition, maximum berries and all this stuff that I wasn't eating on keto. Mm -hmm. So uh, to help, because I, I tend to be a slow a healer. So I had to eat this stuff that, I, that wasn't really on my keto diet. So I gained back 60 pounds during the rehab because I just had to sit and do nothing and then eat what they told me. Right. So uh, that was not on my, uh, I didn't do it on purpose, but that happened. But then I got back on keto and it boosts, it came right back off. So, <laughs> so, well, and so, that's a, that's an extenuating circumstance. Exactly. You that's know what I'm I mean? saying. There was a there, legitimate thing there. Right. Right. There's people who, who go low carb to lose X amount of pounds so that they can fit into, uh, whatever it is. To go to the beach. Yeah. Right. And right. Then, right. And, but then as soon as they start eating carbs again, it, they're like, Oh, I got to go back to, that. well, it's not, so, there's so many other ways for you to have a sustainable, good weight loss, um, that you're going to enjoy and that you're going to stick with. So that, and I that's call really this a lifestyle rather than a diet. Thank you you yep, never hear absolutely. me say diet anymore. It's always lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, my question, I guess that I always ask surrounding this for entrepreneurs and people who start to take their health into more of a consideration and are also owning one or multiple businesses of their own, uh, how much of an impact did it have on you when you were significantly overweight and how much of an impact did it have on your business versus when you started to lose the weight, how much of an impact did that have on your business? And not just you physically, because obviously it has a large impact physically, but mentally, what, what kind of an, uh, uh, an impact did it have on you mentally, both in regards to just overall and in regards to your business? Well, I'm, uh, I think the answer I give you is not going to be maybe what you expect, but, uh, this dad that I was talking about, somehow he imparted to me like some of the finest genes ever on earth. Okay. So, so I, it, even at my, my, uh, peak weight, when I, I went for a physical, and the doctor said to me, and, you know, we could tease with each other. He said, you know, besides you being a fat butt, I can't find anything wrong with you. Your <laughs> blood pressure is fine. Your cholesterol is fine. I've got people half your age falling apart and there's nothing wrong with you. And, uh, he said, he actually said, you should have been a Clydesdale horse. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing was, and, and the, the bad part of that, Ian is that when everything is fine, you think, well, why should I bother passing up that piece of pie? Mm -hmm. 
You know, everything's fine. So that was a, a, one of the hardest things I had to overcome mentally was, you know, okay, yeah, all this stuff is good. And then I'm going to drop one day (laughs) done, you know, I'm going to be gone. So I I have to keep that in mind uh, that even though I got given these great genes, uh, I shouldn't abuse it, you know, because this can't be good in the long run (laughs) as being overweight. So that's what I keep in mind when I see that piece of pie that, oh, you know, I'm still better than that 30 year old over there. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, mm-hmm. you can't think that way. You have to, it's, it's, it's not a race against the 30 year old that's falling apart. It's a race against me. And so after, I guess I, I do want to take a step back because, you know, you ultimately, ha- you got rid of the apartments at, at one point in time, I'm assuming. And the mm-hmm. hotel, yeah, you yeah know, I sold them you, and uh, the, the hotel went to the, uh, sold it to the city. So at what point did you decide that? you you wanted to make a lot of money right and you wanted to become a multi-millionaire and it wasn't just about hey this is great and i'm making money doing this and it's allowing me to go out and you know explore other interests when did you decide you wanted to make a lot of money and you wanted to become a multi-millionaire well first of all that never happened ever That was a byproduct of doing good things in business. I I never, ever thought in those terms. In fact, when I left the nightclub after getting injured and living, I I was actually living, I I got injured and a partner that I had had uh, canceled the health insurance and didn't tell me. And so I'm laid up in a vacant house uh, with a uh, 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 living on a mattress and, and watching a black and white TV, which you've probably never even seen one. <laughs> so it's not maybe true. Heard I one. have. Yes, I have. <laughs> okay. On TV. Uh, so, so my thought at that point was, okay, I got to climb up out of this hole. You know, I was top of the heap and now I'm in the bottom of the heap. What am I going to do? And I'm watching candid camera on television. And I, I thought, you know, everybody loves that show. And this is long before punked and all that stuff came along. And I said, a lot of people love that show, but they can't really participate unless they got lived in California and happened to get caught by the candid camera. So I thought up a, a, a company called prank masters. We custom designed practical jokes. I got better and I was injured, but I finally got better after a couple of years. And then I moved to D.C. and opened up this practical joke service where we custom designed practical jokes. And I starved to death for six months. But then I got some big publicity on the Washington Post and Associated Press picked it up. And then I had 35 people working, pulling custom designed practical jokes. But the impetus to this wasn't to be rich. The impetus was, hey, the next business I get in is going to be fun for me and fun for the people that participate with me. It's not going to be this nasty, rotten beer bottle, you know, killer business. That was the impetus not to get rich. So anyway, uh, I started making, I don't know, 60 to a hundred thousand a year, just writing custom humor and delivering custom, um, uh, comedy for people all over Washington, DC. And, but uh, the whole time in my mind, uh, I was thinking there's something bigger for me, but I was not thinking multimillionaire bigger, just something bigger. And I was getting bored again. (laughs) All right. So, um, I had a bizarre story. I, I was in a bookstore and I moved to let a lady with a a stroller go by and my head hit a book. (laughs) All right. Uh, I'm not much of a woo woo guy, but this is kind of woo woo. The book was called speak and grow rich. Um, it was a spinoff of the other, you know, Grow Rich book. Yeah, Thinking and Grow Rich. Thinking Grow Rich. Mm-hmm. And so I said I bought it, and it was about professional speaking. And so I read it like crazy. I thought this is perfect for me. I'm funny, and I'm you know glib, and uh, you know this, and I got lots of business experience. So I had a consultation with the lady that wrote the book, uh, Dottie Walters. She's passed away now, and. Uh, and I started my speaking career in 1991, and uh, and that was the bigger thing. I was still doing gorilla grams on one hand, and I'm speaking at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. <laughs> you know, I didn't, of course, didn't tell them that. All right, until the transition came, where I was making so much money as a speaker 
that I just let the practical joke company uh, slide away. But it still gave me a lot of great stories because I was very entertaining as a speaker in, in addition to having a lot of good business information. Then in 1994 is when the commercial internet came along. And I thought, you know, it's hard enough to sell my tapes and stuff at the back of the room yeah. or even across the street. But now I can sell them around the world from my desktop. I'm going to figure this out. And so for two years, I was day and night studying internet in addition to my speaking career. And then I got good training from a guy named Corey Rudel in 1996. He was like the, the 30 year old grandfather of internet marketing. And then I started making money and it started taking off and I developed butt camp, which is from my comic background. Everybody's begging me to teach them internet stuff and I'm not going to do a boot camp because everybody does boot camp. So I thought I'm sitting here on my rear end making all this money. I'll call it butt camp. <laughs> <laughs> and so it caught on. I've done them in 11 countries around the world. It's the longest running. There was th about three of us in those days around 1997. This is Mine's the only one still running, the longest running internet seminar there is. And uh, except in England, they maybe call it bum camp instead of butt camp. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so that was kind of the evolution. So, uh, and to, to kind of spin off of the evolution as far as your seminars go, I want to talk about your seminars a little bit more because, you know, you were getting a little disgusted with the, the ripoffs in the seminar industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. And unfortunately, that is no different still to this day. I mean, I there are definitely still some big time ripoffs that happen in the seminar industry. And the thing that's really, really unfortunate is now in 2019, it costs next to nothing to run a Facebook ad and you can target so specifically who you want to target and people can run these ads and you don't even have to go anywhere for the seminar, right? Like you just said, right. you know, because it's called boot camp, butt camp, whatever you want to call it. But you know, you're, you're sitting in front of your computer. Well, people nowadays, they actually, they, they conduct the seminar one time or they just go through and do it from their office one time. And then they're actually just posting a re-recorded seminar. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've signed up for a webinar that's supposed to give you free information. They give you eh, maybe one to two tips that you already know. And then at the end of the seminar comes their big pitch to push you into their click funnel, which then makes them a bunch of money and you have no idea what you really just got yourself into. So, <laughs> yep. I mean, uh, you know, what did you do to, to make this different and obviously have one of the most longstanding online seminars? Well, the thing was, is uh, I used the same exact mechanism that you just described. It's just that I give massive value and I'm known for that for umpteen years now. So you don't, if you don't spend a nickel, your time will not be wasted on one of my webinars. You will learn an enormous amount, mm -hmm. but I'm still going to offer you further because there's no way you can know everything I know in 90 minutes, right? right? So if you, if you liked what that, you'll get a hundred times more than that. If you buy my stuff where a lot of these people, it's just a sales letter. Uh, in the form of a webinar with mm -hmm. no real material. It's always the promise of the secrets later, you know, and then secrets never come. So, so that's the big difference. And, and they still want to get you in person if they can, because they, they get the mob mentality and the, the riot mentality and people will, will spend money that they shouldn't have because they have shills in the crowd and everybody's excited and dancing and all this crap. And uh, so they would rather have you in person if possible, but there's still plenty of ways to rob you online. <laughs> right. So, yeah. And I think one of the the things that uh, we we glossed over a little bit, and, and I want to take a step back and touch on is when we were discussing uh, you becoming a multimillionaire, mm -hmm. and that was never actually your goal, right? Pro never. Providing not, a, not even once. Now I brag about it now because I'm proud of it. But it always stemmed from me giving massive value. In mm -hmm. fact, I wrote a book called The One Sentence Business Plan. And I have lived this since I was 10 years old. Here it is for all of your listeners. The, my one sentence business plan. If every company on earth would live by this simple plan, we'd all be better off. Here it is. I create quality products that somebody actually wants at a reasonable price 
and I service the customer after the sale. That's it mm -hmm. right there. Quality products that somebody actually wants at a reasonable price, and I service them after the sale. Since I'm 10 years old, that is what made me a multimillionaire. Just rinse and repeat that over and over and over again. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, like we were saying, it. I think that that's... It was something that was we glossed over, but it's important to mention because there is, you know, this law of attraction and, and people who want to make a lot of money, you know, they have to think that they want to make a lot of money. They got to feel like, it, you know, but I think it's also important to note that you have made a lot of money and that was never actually your intention. Your intention was to provide value to people and to help people in an area where you saw a need. Right. And that's always going to get you further than going for the money mm -hmm. because people see that, that you don't really care about their success or care about your quality or the excellence I talked about that my dad taught me a long time ago. They can see that. So they're less likely to refer you. They're more likely to ask for refunds or charge back their credit card. And it doesn't snowball to the good. It snowballs to the bad when you're just going for the money and you leave this trail of blood behind you of people losing their homes. I have a evidence file on one guy, 48 victims on it, anywhere from 13 to a hundred thousand dollars. He stole from him, you know? So, um, so you don't see that uh, about, you know, honest people and they, you can still, and a lot of these scammers are so brilliant. If they would just channel it to good stuff, they could be just as rich without all this negativity surrounding. It's them. like drug dealers. Yeah. Like, drug dealers, Deep down inside, drug dealers are entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Like, imagine if they took that. I've watched uh, now. I, I'm gonna go off on a, on a, a little tangent, but it. I promise I'll bring it back together. I watch Drugs Inc. like religiously, right? I absolutely love the show. It just, I don't know. It's just for pure entertainment purposes. I just love Drugs Inc. It just, it, it's something that I, I, it's my vice. Like, okay. I, I enjoy watching it, right? I sit there and I watch these guys. And they, just the same way that you tried to figure out how to put another bedroom in that original apartment so that you could make an extra mm -hmm. 125 bucks, these guys do the same exact thing, but they're just doing it illegally. It's like right, they're, exactly. they're, they're selling illegal and illicit drugs, but had they taken that and applied it to putting an additional room in an apartment so they could make another 125 bucks every month, like they'd be just fine. So it's interesting to me that the, these guys, you know, they're, they're, just like the scammers, they're doing something illegal, but man, if they just applied it elsewhere, they'd be in business, like no pun uh, intended. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, and I actually uh, did a webinar about this at Tom Antion webinars. The first webinar I have up there is the sociopathic mind in the speaking business, you know, because it's so easy to get into the speaking business and these sociopaths are like chameleons. They can be and appear to be whatever it takes to rob you. Mm -hmm. You know, they're professional level con people. Yeah. And so the the industry was just uh, filled with that. That's why I don't speak as much anymore at these big public seminars because everybody's trying to beat me and they just make up bigger lies that I know they're not going to deliver, you know, from uh, when the time comes. So that's, that's why I took even a step further. See, the internet business is totally unregulated. Even though the Federal Trade Commission's there, none of this is even a drip in their bucket to right. look at. You know, I went to the FBI over this guy that stole half a million dollars. They said, "Oh, Tom, he's the scumbag, but we don't have enough local victims, and we're tied up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Homeland Security. Half a million dollars he robbed, and uh, they, it's not enough for them to fool with. You know, so these scammers know this. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's a." Uh, kind of a rotten business. So, so it's unregulated. So what I did is to set myself apart. I went through three years of scrutiny to open the only licensed, dedicated internet marketing school in the country. It's imtcva.org. And uh, I had to go through background checks for me, the instructors, financial things, bonding, security bonds, all this stuff the spot checks where I can get a thousand dollar fine per occurrence per student if I do something wrong. And so, uh, it's the only one in the country. And it just, uh, I said, nobody on this earth in the internet marketing field has gone through that kind of scrutiny. Nobody. I triple dog dare you find somebody that has, and they have. 
But it, at the same time, it looks good for you. And now people know that you are someone that they can trust. And it is not just simply, you know, one of these other scammers, just another guy knocking on their door or, their, yeah, and- you know, Facebook timeline, wherever it may be, um, who's looking to scam them out of some money. Yeah, and they got recourse because the State Council on Higher Education of Virginia will pull my license in a heartbeat mm-hmm. if I did something fraudulent. You know, so where nobody else, I mean, you've got people, super big names in this industry, convicted felons, had their assets frozen for fraud, you know, plenty of them, not just one, right. <laughs> plenty of them. So, uh, so it's good to deal with something that's regulated uh, to a point so that you can be sure you're covered and you're not, you know, throwing your money down a hole. And so now that you have, you had the success with the hotels, you had the success with the apartments, you've had the success with, you know, the success, the rise and the fall of the nightclub. Um, you've had now the seminar business and the, the the joke business, the speaking business. You've had all (laughs) these, you've had a lot of success. Um, what, especially let's, let's kind of focus in on after the nightclub, you know, what keeps you going? What keeps you moving forward? What keeps you taking that next step to get better, to try something new, um, and ultimately to keep succeeding? Well, it's, uh, again, it wasn't the money. It, it's the, uh, the thing that, um, I, I love to see people successful I just go crazy when, I mean, a lady came, I was doing a fundraiser up in Philadelphia. Somebody had heard me speak 20 years ago and came up in tears saying that I had, uh, you know, changed the whole course of her family, saved them from, you know, financial ruin. And I don't even know who it was, you know, I don't even know the lady. And, uh, you know, so that, that kind of stuff you can't uh, buy. So that keeps me motivated. And then it's just a constant quest. It's, it's the Japanese call it Kaizen, a uh, constant improvement. And, and I'm always trying to learn something. For instance, I have seven air conditioners that I own in my estate uh, here at the, the retreat center. And they're all R22, which is the old Freon. Well, that's going to cost thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to replace all of them. So I'm, I'm going to get my EPA certification to handle refrigerants <laughs> just online. I'm just studying, watching YouTube videos, taking practice tests, you know, because I could probably fix everything for five, $6,000 if I knew, <laughs> if I got my certification. <laughs> so, so it's just a constant, uh, you know, kind of what my dad instilled in me, uh, was one of his things was uh, learn and be self-sufficient. So it's just a constant thing with me. It's like no big deal. People, the employees here, like wonder, like I'm the Tasmanian devil let loose when Mm -hmm. some problem happens because, you know, a lot of the young people, I'll tell you, they're just, uh, the problem I I have with it is the parents are always making the next generation, making their life better. Well, you get to a point, you make the kid's life so good that the kid can't do anything, right? And and that's, uh, that scares me. It's where I was taught to be self-sufficient and I have like monuments to my dad and examples of how he, uh, was self-sufficient when, uh, nobody was around to help. He didn't stop, you know, he just kept going and working and worked through things. So, so, um, so it's just a constant, uh, improvement with me and, the uh, and the thrill of seeing people succeed and, I, knowing that I had uh, a part in it from one business to another. I am assuming that you had a learning experience, right? And it was a learning experience that could be applied to whatever that next business was. It it didn't necessarily have to be, you know, from hotel to, or I'm sorry, from apartment to hotel, there's definitely some things that you learned there that could, could, you know, it's specific to that industry. But there's probably other things that you learned across the board. So in your opinion, what do you think your number one tool for success has been? No question. No question about it. Persistence. I won't quit. You know, you know, if you run into, if you have a stupid idea and you keep pursuing it, well, that's not a good idea to be too persistent about it. But if you have a viable idea, most people just quit too soon. You know, they won't, they don't have the, um, 
the experience of fighting through uh, problems to get to the final goal. So uh, there's no question about it. Persistence. And then second to that would be consistency. You know, if, if anybody that knows me knows what to expect from me, it's not like I wonder if he's going to show up. Oh, look at, look at this thing. I was here early, right? Mm-hmm. I was bugging you. Hey, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's do it. I'm ready. I'm early. If you're not early, you're late in my, opinion. Right, <laughs> so, right, right. you know, I was even bothering you about it, but, but you know what to expect from me. So people like that when they do business with you, they'll, they'll know, Hey, if I buy something from Tom and uh, does not really right for me, he's not going to hassle me. You know, I can depend on him. So persistency and consistency are by far bigger than any kind of skill set you have or anything else, because you can learn how to do stuff. But if you quit, if you're a quitter, you know, it doesn't matter how much, you know, if you quit too soon. Well, and on the flip side of that, I actually wanted to ask you, um, what is one thing that you quit doing that helped you become successful? Hmm. What did I quit doing to help me become successful? Oh boy, you guys, very seldom do you get me speechless. Uh, what did I quit doing that helped me become successful? Hmm. And uh, what, another interesting thing about me is that I never look backwards. And so that's why you really caught me because people like ask me what I did yesterday and I'm always looking forwards and it almost looks like I'm lying because I, I can't remember. It was just whatever I had to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, I guess if I had to pin it down, I would say I would have, um, I quit hiring, uh, people are the wrong people. Yeah, that uh, that's probably one of the biggest ones. I learned how to hire the right people. And I've had some people working for me 10, well, no, one is 14 years now. You know, so uh, I think that's it. I learned to hire, so I quit hiring uh, the wrong people just because they were personable. Um that didn't mean that they had the right work ethic to suit me. There there's the answer. That and that's you really got that's a big one. I mean, when, yeah, when it comes big, to owning your own businesses, like that's something that's very, very important. You got to be good at hiring. You got to be good at, at doing the interviews. You got to be good at selecting the right people uh, because it is going to help you in your success. So, no, that, that, I think, well, I did I catch a, you, but I think that was a good answer. Was well, I have answer. a really bizarre, I don't know how much time we have, but a really bizarre hiring method. That a lot of people don't have the guts to do. I mean, do you, you want to hear about it? Yes, absolutely. Please share okay. it with us. Okay. So the only place I can get away with this is Craigslist. And that's where everybody that works here came from Craigslist. And I write really mean, rotten ads and that would never fly on uh on you know Monster or any of these other mm-hmm. places. So I write an ad. First of all, it's a balanced ad. So it says, okay, you could work for an internationally known super uh, guru in the internet marketing field, and you're going to learn all this great stuff. Awesome. But then it gets down to the point that guess what though? If you're a worthless slug, I actually say this, if you're a worthless slug that doesn't care about the quality of your work. You won't last five minutes around here. If the owner doesn't throw you out, all the other good people that work here will. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it knocked out all the crap people that were that kind of person. It scared them off. So the only people that apply are the ones that are saying, I'll show him. I really, I'm a good employee. I'll show this guy. <laughs> and then some of them, like I said, been here 12 years. <laughs> so, so that's my uh, crazy hiring method that just works beautifully, but you got to have the guts to do it because that's pretty mean to say that kind of stuff. You got to have the guts to apply too. I mean, that's got to take exactly. some, that's that take some gusto, you know? <laughs> that was the point. I only got people that really cared about the quality of their work to apply. So Tom, I just, before I, I ask you this last question, um, I just want to take a minute to allow you the opportunity to let people know uh, where they can find you, where they can get connected with you, and where they can uh, learn more or continue to follow what you are up to. Sure. Well, uh, because of my past uh, of not having a job, 
and having such a crazy, we didn't even get to all the crazy stuff I've done, but, but, uh, people say, well, that's kind of, how could you possibly do all that stuff? Well, the answer is, is I was never sitting in traffic, uh, commuting to a job, making somebody else rich. So you can live two or three lives if you're not doing that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I named my podcast, screw the commute. <laughs> and so, so, uh, it's a very popular entrepreneurial podcast. Uh, you can find everything that I do there. It leads you to all the resources we have, lots of free stuff. We have paid programs you can get in. Uh, you can uh, subscribe to the podcast. You can reach me directly there. So screwthecommute.com is your, is your basic hub for uh, uh, all the stuff that I do. Fantastic. Fantastic. And yes, that uh, even if you just go to the about section, you'll find... Um, the 22 things that you may not have known about Tom, <laughs> which is uh, what, what really helped me in uh, designing some of my questions and coming up with some of the topics that I wanted to hit on. But yes, there are 22 things that are listed there. So that's just a brief little uh, intro into some of the things that you've done. So, you know, I don't think we have enough time to get into all 22, <laughs> no, all maybe, 22 of those. Maybe things, I'll but... come back or maybe we'll, you'll be on my podcast. And I'll tell you about some more of them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the last question that I, I always like to um, pose to my guests that, while they're on the podcast is it, I have a question that takes a couple different forms, but for the purposes of today, um, you have had quite a bit of experience building things and building businesses and taking that first step because of your persistence and not giving up. But there are people who may be listening to this podcast that have not taken the first step and they are very nervous about taking the first step and or they have a lot of excuses as to why they cannot take that first step. And this does not necessarily have to be centered around business. It doesn't necessarily have to be centered around weight loss. It could be just surrounding anything that they want to do, but they have not launched yet because for whatever reason, they won't take that first step. So what is something that you could say to them to help them get off of the couch, get off of the bench, wherever they are, and take that first step into building this dream that they would like to live. Well, Ian, I'm most qualified to talk about business stuff since I've been living and breathing that for 40 plus years. So uh, today is the best time on earth to be in a business. And I understand it's hard to for somebody that's getting a paycheck to just say, oh, well, I'm just going to quit and uh, see how it goes. That's too risky. That doesn't make sense, especially if you got kids or family to take care of. So the beauty about what we're doing now online is that with the advent of digital products, which I say advent, but I've been selling digital products since 2001. So it's not like it's any kind of new thing. But at 97% profit, and you can create them with software that you already have on your, your computer. You know, Microsoft Word converted to Adobe PDF, you got an ebook. Mm -hmm. Converted to Kindle, you got an ebook in front of 200 million people on Amazon. So the risk is extremely low to get into this. And my goal for people like you just described is to make it too expensive for them to go to work anymore. So they build up something as a side hustle, they call it now, and get some of these products selling at 97% profit, which most businesses are lucky if they can you know, do 5% profit. And then they start to see, hey, this is real. and they get to the point where if they would just stay home for a day and make a new digital product, they could make more than going to work that week. You know, so when you reach that point, it's not so risky. But in the beginning, just start out creating some ebooks. Simple. It's easy to learn to do, cost you nothing to try, and uh, start selling them. And that will be uh, some, the first step that you could take that's no risk to you or your family that could potentially change the course of history for you and your family. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tom, I just want to say uh, thank you again for joining me on this 
afternoon's edition of the Do It For Yourself podcast. Um, I've really enjoyed getting connected with you, and obviously I've really enjoyed our conversation and kind of getting to deep dive into just a small portion of some of the things that you have been up to over these last years. So thank you for sharing your story and sharing some of these experiences with us here on the Do It For Yourself podcast. Um, And I look forward to staying connected and possibly coming to share my story on your podcast. Sounds good. So everybody uh, go out there and screw the commute. All right, my friends, that... That is my conversation with Tom Antion. How did that one impact you? How did it hit you? How did it make you feel? I feel like the the counselor from, oh, I can't even remember the name of the movie. How does that make you feel? I'm pretty sure it was an Adam Sandler movie. Um, I digress, but thank you guys for hanging out with us today. I really appreciate it. As I said in the intro, I'm lacking in the reviews department on Apple Podcasts. So if you could take a quick two minutes to leave me a review on there, I get messages all the time about how great the podcast is. Um, People really enjoy my style of interviewing. They enjoy the sound of my voice and how, you know, I kind of deliver the podcast. So all of those things are very, very important to include in reviews. So if you could, please just two minutes um while you're listening or when you think of it you know take take that time just leave me a review and it will be very very helpful so thank you so much for hanging out with tom and i today and i am looking forward to sharing another interview with you next week Mm -hmm.